Welcome back to Following Know It On, a Stormlight podcast. This week is episode 31, and we'll be covering chapters 26 through 30 of Words of Radiance. We have some interesting perspectives. We have a Sadius chapter this week, this week, gentlemen. How do we how are we feeling about this week's this week's group of chapters? It was pretty cool. I definitely enjoyed them. Um, and yeah, I was a little surprised with the Sadius chapter, but but I kind of liked it. I feel like tension is building in these chapters, and I'm I'm rather nervous as to what we're we're building to. So interesting chapters for sure, but making me want to know what's next. Yeah, we're we're coming up on the end of part two. Actually, we're definitely headed towards the uh, the middle part of, of Words of Radiance. Do you guys have two words to des- to describe chapters 26 through 30 of Words of Radiance? Uh, Elliot, we'll go with you first. For these chapters, I've got hidden and hesitation. Hidden and hesitation. Paul, what about you? Uh, this week, my two words are delving and conniving. Delving and conniving. All right. Let's use these four words and see what we got. All righty. I will get back to you guys' words here in a second. But we have a special segment this week and I oh and I am looking forward to both of y'all's uh I'm sure you inputs are. for this. I'm not. So I'm ever not. since if you guys remember back in the Way of Kings, it was pretty pretty early. I think it was part 2 that that Kaladin was getting to know Teft and Rock. And Rock is a little hesitant to give Kaladin his his actual full name, but he does. And Paul, do you remember? Do you remember Rock's full name? Can you give us a give a shot at it? I, I definitely can. It's actually not that hard now. Numuhuku Makiaki Aino Lunamor. Great. And yes. these these names from the Horn Eater Peaks are kind of like a sentence. They're that they, they describe the the character or or the person that they're that they have a name for. And this week we have we have a made up one, but it's still a, a horn eater name nonetheless. In in a chapter we'll get to here in a little bit, Shalon meets Kaladin and introduces herself as a horn eater princess and gives him a fake name. So we have a spell check this week and we'll do, go with Elliot first. What is how would you pronounce Shalon's Horn Eater Princess name that she gives Kaladin? Oh, okay. I'll try. With with rocks, I was at least a little confident going into it because I could there was a pronunciation in my head I could at least spat out. This one I trip over several of the syllables and like can't even make it through, but I'll give it a shot for you guys. Uh, here we go. Shalon's horn eater princess name is obviously pronounced Unu Luku Akina Autu Atai ish, something like that. It's very close. That was good. That was good. I'm not going that to correct good. you because I don't I don't have any semblance of how they say it in the book. Like I know how they say it, <laughs> but I can't reproduce it. So uh, Paul, you can try it if you want, but or or you can pass either way. Uh, yeah, I think I I think I can say it. Um, I say that, and then I'm going to stumble all over it. But that, and then I'll give my spelling. I did spend a considerable amount of time on this trying to get the <laughs> spelling. Um, but yeah, so so at least how I heard it uh, in the book, it's Unulukuak Ikina Awa Tua Tua. The last part's hard. Ikina Awa Tua T. Okay. Tua Tai. Sorry, Tua Tai. Uh huh. Yes, yeah, that was a rough translation, uh, and my <laughs> my spelling of it was 
U N U L U K U A K apostrophe. Okay. And then this is where it gets rockier. Uh-huh. No pun intended. K E N A O U T U A T I. Okay, you were pretty close. I can, you're, I can, I can say that again. You're very close. You're like uh, probably 80% accuracy. This is pretty impressive. Okay. So this is how they spell Let's it. Go. It is Princess U-N-U-L-U-K-U-A-K apostrophe. You're 100% right, right so far. K-I-N-A apostrophe A-U-T-U apostrophe A T. T A I. All the okay. apostrophes. I I will say I almost had another apostrophe in there, but not there. I almost had it before the first A, like Unuluku apostrophe Ak or A K apostrophe, and then the rest. Gotcha. I, but I actually sc- I scratched that. Um, but yeah, I, w- I went with several guesses. I thought there may have been a W at the end or near the end. Uh, but I, I scratched that and went with what I had. But yeah, I was uh, the the first part wasn't too hard. Right, you just have to go with it's all going to be used. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'll chalk that up to to it. Yes, yeah, I'm pretty happy with both of y'all's performances there. I I really want to know now, like what that means, because like Tin just made that up on the spot, right? Yep. I mean, is this just True. garbage or did she just say something yeah. like insulting to Kaladin in in Horn Eater or <laughs> I, I'm curious the world so anyone out there who's fluent in Horn Eater help us out that here. would be great yes please that would be great yeah I don't even know if Brandon Sanderson is fluent in uh Horn Eater so <laughs> I feel like he would have to know for the name he uses you know maybe not maybe fluent fluent I feel like there's got to be something something there either that or it's just Tim was coming up with garbage you know just random <laughs> random letters right all right so let's get back to our to our word summaries a uh, we'll, we'll do elliot first can you remind us of, our, of your two words and then go into a little explanation yeah so i had hidden and hesitation for hidden i honestly like paul's word better i, I wish i'd thought of it paul you said conniving right as one of yours that's kind of what I was was what I was hitting on with with hidden. It seemed like there were a lot of hidden motives in these chapters, of everything from Sadius to Shalon to Tin to even Yakimov a little bit. Um, so just lots of things that are kind of hiding. We even had the Shalon flashback chapter with some hidden stuff, kind of in those chapters. So lots of little things seem to be hiding from other things, and then hesitation. I just had I had a hesitation just because we see hesitation a few times through through these sections. We see Renarin who freezes up in battle and he he hesitates and he can't he can't fight. And then Shalon is really hesitating throughout a lot of this, really trying to figure out what to do with with Tin. Does she follow Tin? Does she try to learn from Tin? What is she going to do with Tin when they get to the Shattered Plains? Just a lot of a lot of kind of trying to process and figure out what what they need to do next from from our characters here. Paul, yeah, I, I was actually going to say I kind of liked Elliot's words. Um, <laughs> I so I'll first touch on conniving because he mentioned that that was mostly my biggest thought on that was with Sadius. Um, and kind of how, from what we see, he's always trying to like look at like Adolin and Dalinar if he can, and and kind of trying to, he's trying to I guess win this this kind of battle they're in, um, and how he can do that, and so he's kind of scheming with all the other camps and things like that. So that was the primary reason I chose conniving, um, delving was honestly for a lack of a better word i i didn't quite know how to a, a word to for like digging yourself into a hole and that's how i feel like shalon was in our boots chapter mm-hmm. um which which is super funny um it's, her and ten kind of we, we had we kind of have the the first meeting i guess with 
Shalon pulling up to the Shattered Plains, and I feel like her and Ten have already dug themselves into a hole that I don't know how they're going to get out of. So, when Kaladin introduces himself as Dalinar's captain of the guard, she's like, "Oh, dang it!" <laughs> yeah. Oops. One of her first thoughts was like, "Hopefully, I just won't see these soldiers again." Yep. And <laughs> we know that they're probably the most important soldiers in the story. Yep. You know, for the camp. So, all right. So, usually in these chapters, we can kind of group some together and talk about them all together. But a lot of these chapters are kind of one-off, like by themselves. Don't there isn't really a they don't really piece together that well. So we'll kind of just go in in chronological order with these and see how they go. Chapter 26 is an Adolin chapter, actually. And it's it's him on the Shattered Plains on a on a bridge run, on a plateau run. And he's fighting on what my mind tells me is a I don't know if they say this in the book, but it's like a three-tiered cake almost and like it's this huge hill and there's like three distinct tiers on it and you're climbing from tier to tier to try to fight the parshendi and he's doing it with his old friend yakimov anyone have any thoughts on this chapter um because i have a few but they don't come till the end of the chapter i at least liked it kind of let off with some action right they're fighting the the parshendi um and, and it was really cool i with the whole three tiered plateau or wherever they are, mm-hmm. um, that was really confusing and it makes me think it's more significant than it probably is because I felt like Brandon Sanderson spent a lot of time describing it, like kind of an awkwardly long amount of time describing mm-hmm. it, even though I really don't think it's important at all. Right. But I I'll stop you there because I think it might I think it might be because I, I too thought the description stood out a little bit. And the reason why was you got your three tier cake, but then he describes it as there's like a, a, like a, like a cut right through the entire center of the entire plateau. And he, he talks about how, or at least Adolin's thinking about how that seems so unnatural. You'd think if like an earthquake happened, you know, maybe half the plateau would like fall over or it would kind of, you know, start to crumble at the base. But instead it's like something has come through and just taken a massive like gouge out of this, almost as if like a, you know, a shard blade the size of like a, a tower, you know, a mile long went and like swept through it or something. Maybe that's hinting at the origins of the shattered planes and like what happened to create them. But yeah, I don't know. It, it it was an interesting de- description in that it you, we dwelt on it for longer than normal. If I had to make a guess about it, if it is significant, I think it's something that we're not going to get. It might be like Probably. a rereader kind of thing, like a comeback for a rereader or something. That's that's my guess because I, I feel like it's a little too obscure of a thing to be relevant. But he, like you said, it. It was an awkwardly long like description, and I was like, yeah. "Really? We're we're still going." I do want to <laughs> I do want to stop here for a second because this isn't the only lore hint that he drops. This is the same chapter. This is the epigraph in front of this chapter. They blame our people for the loss of that land, the city that once covered it, did range the eastern strand, the power made known in the tomes of our clan our gods were not were not who shattered these plains from the listener songs of war 55th stanza songs of war could that be rhythm of war perhaps Ooh. but that's that's not the only uh cryptic not not natural thing that is dropped in this chapter. Fair. Fair. The last line there, our gods are not who shatter these planes. That one can, stands out to me and confuses me because the description of this plateau makes me think something supernatural did this, like at the god level. But then for this Parshendi poem to say, 
our gods are not who shatter these planes. Th that's the first guess I would have had is that this was Voidbringers or their gods or somebody. So to say that it's not, I, I have no idea who shattered these planes. Yeah, I'll leave it there. No more, no more hints from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so into this, into this chapter, Yakimov and Adolin are fighting, and I remember on my first read through, Adolin uses his shard blade in a way that I always wondered if it could be possible. So he basically jumps onto this cliff face, summons his shard blade, and stabs it into the rock pulls himself up onto it and stands on it and then does it again. And then he like, he like dismisses the blade and then stabs it again and, and stands on the stands on his blade. I just thought that was so cool on my, I remember on my first read through, I'm like, wow, how innovative to just have a magic system and then use it to climb a rock. Like that's so, that's so cool to me, but. I, that is, I actually didn't catch that. That was what he was doing. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how I missed that, but that's actually really cool. Yeah, he like climbs up onto the the flat of the blade and stands on it, and then grabs the wall and then dismisses it and does it again. I I too thought that was super cool, and it 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 reminded me too just how the shard blades work, which is still kind of unique, and I'm still trying to grasp it because my mind tends to kind of default to like lightsabers right you, you think of shard blades as they pass through anything so my mind starts to think of them as as like this blade that's maybe not necessarily there but it is there something you wouldn't be able to stand on but that's that's not true they they can slice through things like their edge just melts through anything like butter but it's still a metal blade it's still an actual thing that he can stand on it'll hold his weight and then he can he can jump off of it which is still super yeah a little hard to maybe get my mind around yeah there is there is some substance there and it's easy to forget that oh you just dismiss it because it was never there it's just a, a spirit cutter thing sharp are cool i want one i'm sure your local convenience store can help you with that I think, um, yeah, I'll pick one up next time. Yeah. I think you said that like on our very first episode of of following Noah. Did I? That you wanted a shard blade. Yeah, I still want one. I mean, who doesn't want one? Let's be real. True. They're pretty cool. I'd give them a ten out of ten. In all honesty, um, even though I haven't even used one. <laughs> um, if you guys. So speaking of shard blades, go ahead, Paul. Also, well, I was going to say that we we see the. Only Parshendi shard bearer again um, at the end of this episode, and that was a yeah. uh, that kind of got me excited because honestly, that had kind of left my mind. I'm really excited for the things like like Shalon getting to the shattered planes and potentially like a Zeth Zeth finally showing up or something. But I hadn't really thought any more about Esha and I, um, our Parshendi shard bearer, and she talks to Adolin and. Basically sets up a, a talk. basically asks like if she can send a messenger because she wants to talk with Dalinar, which I think is really cool, and I'm excited for that now. Um, getting to see some development with that, hopefully in the in the future. I I too was excited to see Esha and I back. I'm I'm glad to see that she's still pursuing a, a peaceful resolution here I, I still have hope that that's a that that's a possibility where we kind of left her with the interlude that we saw she was headed off to maybe discover storm form and i think i talked about this back then that i was a little worried we were this was going to get escalated that the parshendi were then going to come in with these new powers and just kind of crush the the left the army and at least that's not happening at least it's not super powered esher and i coming back to just obliterate everyone she wants to talk so that's that's really positive news. I hope that I hope it actually does happen. I hope that Dalinar or Elokar or somebody can have some sort of a peace talk with uh, uh, with Esh and I. I think that would that would be pretty big. That'd be huge. So this actually ties in to chapter twenty nine, I believe it is, with Sadius, and I'll explain it here in a second. That 
Sadius opens up the chapter remembering how the Parshenda used to try to surrender and the and he personally would slaughter every one of them that tried to surrender and r- rather quickly they learned that you don't you don't try to surrender to the Alethi because they're just going to kill you however Eshonai is specifically looking for Dalinar because Dalinar or because Eshonai knows that Dalinar is going to be more honorable and has a better character than than Sadius and it's really easy I would imagine it would be really easy for her to just group the Alethi in one in one group of they're the bad guys, we're the good guys, you know, and not want to talk. But she specifically is looking to talk to Dalinar. And it's that's a good thing because Sadius has not made a good name for the Alethi among the among the Parshendi because they haven't tried to to surrender yet or, or since like five years ago or whenever that was. So there's a uh, there's some interesting lines being drawn here. I I thought that that bit in chapter twenty nine was another good example of the Parshendi being a bit misunderstood here because the Lethi have this view of them as these barbaric I don't know barbarians for lack of a better word right. who throw themselves into battle. They never surrender. They fight to the death. They're just there for blood and violence. But we learn in that little line there in chapter 29 that they did originally try to surrender. They were much more of a civilized, if you will, army. The only reason they don't is because someone like Sadius slaughtered them all when they tried to surrender. And so it's because of the actions of the Alethi that they're behaving the way they are. But the Alethi layperson doesn't, understand that and so they still have this perverted view of of what the the Parshendi are do you think Dalinar wants to talk to Eshenai oh yes I think he definitely would want to I think the Dalinar of now, nowadays, at this point in the story, will. Which I'm glad Dalinar went on the journey he did in Way of Kings that we kind of saw. Because I think the Dalinar of like a year ago would not have. And so I do hope that Dalinar does agree to, to talk and they can do that. I cannot envision him just flat out not wanting to. It may not be like the kind of talk like he might not meet with Ash and I or something, but yeah, at least messengers of some sort. But yeah, I, it, he's not just going to be like, no, I don't want to hear anything. You know, if so, I will be a little disappointed. By a little disappointed, I mean a lot. D- but Dalinar, Dalinar just wants progress in the war, one way or the other. Either make peace and go home. Or slaughter them all if that's what it comes to. He just wants the the war to be over because he he now sees it as a waste of time for the Alethi to be there because they're no longer there for vengeance in his mind. Do you guys remember who Yakimov is? Yakimov is. I definitely remember that name. Is he one of the other like camp leader? people i don't remember for sure adolin was like talking fashion with him back in a while a, while, a few chapters ago right or back in i don't even remember now when it was was it way it of was kings? the way of kings so yeah so yakimov and adolin are kind of are they're friends they're both sons of high princes they they go to wine houses together that type of thing and they're on this plateau run together and yakimov tells him in no uncertain terms, hey, I'm not going to hang out with you until Dalinar's in the better light and better standings with the rest of the High Princes. It's not good to be seen with you in public. And Adolin doesn't take it so well. I don't think I'd take it well either. That's not a very... Y- Yakimov is not a great friend, we are finding out. There's definitely a lot of political stuff with the, the upper-ups 
people in this story, I feel like. So it's like, yeah, it's like disappointed, but not surprised, you know? Right. Yeah. That's kind of how I, I feel about it. Um, speaking yes. of disappointing, before we go to some of the other chapters, I think we should talk about 29 because I feel like 29 in this one. Go go hand in hand a little bit. Sure. At least with talk about Sadius. Um I don't know if y'all have anything else to say about twenty six. If not, I have some stuff to say about twenty nine. I do have one more thing to say about twenty six, but it actually ties to twenty seven. So I will wait for that and we'll circle back to it. Um Okay. But yes, so Sadius understands Dalinar's strategy here of disarming the high princes of their shard blades and is trying everything he can to get Adolin to no duels. Um, any any thoughts about about this chapter? Yeah, Sadius, Sadius is on to him pretty fast, or Sadius and his wife, Eli, is that how we E-L-A. pronounce her name? Eli? Eli? Sadius and Eli, they're, they're on, yeah, they're on to him. They, they know what's going on. They, they clearly are, are not going to have one pulled over on them that easily and this seems like a pretty easy uh, counter move to that well you're going to try and duel everyone well we'll just make sure you can't get any duels and it seems to be sort of working at least i mean we see in chapter 29 right adolin has got his second duel and this is where we go through the whole he's faking it not being great and sadius notices that and, and all that yeah it is important to notice that sadius notices that adolin is faking at first, he thought, like everyone else, that, oh, Adolin's not actually that good. He's just back into dueling, and he wants to duel for shard blades because he's arrogant. And then he realizes, no, he's tr- he's pretending to be bad so that other people will duel him, thinking they can win his shards from him. And at the end of the chapter, actually, Sadius tells Eli to stop hindering people from dueling uh, Adolin. He has a new strategy here. Did y'all pick up on that? Yes, that's what I wanted to bring up the most because um one I was so happy to hear that because I'm I want Adolin duels just cuz it's really really cool. Um and two that that's part of why I chose my word conniving mostly um because well Sadie is is he's always like in charge but behind the scenes you know, and I feel like that's him really trying to pull more strings. So I don't fully remember his reasoning of why he was like, yes, let's do that, like full send on the duels. But he did. I know it was for a very intentional purpose. Like he's doing it for his personal gain. He thinks it will still be best for him, Um, obviously. But... The other, the other bit that I picked out of, of this chapter, chapter 29, is that Sadius and, and ELA talk about the assassination of Elokar, the, the attempted assassination of Elokar a few chapters back, right? Yep. Like four or five chapters, we had that whole railing incident. But they, they clearly talk about it in a way that makes it clear that they're not involved. So this that was a, that was a bit of a revelation to me that we can cross Sadius off the list as he was not the one who who tried to kill Elokar, at least in that instance. So that that was some information. But they did find out of their own accord. So they do have leaks in the king's in the king's palace. Yes. There are some sort of Indeed. some spies there. Cause Dalinar or Sadius is the high prince of information. And Dalinar didn't go deliberately didn't go to Sadius because you know they're not on great terms right now. Um, he didn't go to Sadius, but Sadius found out found out anyway. So there's obviously some sort of information leak there that Eli has. Paul, kind of backtracking a little bit, you had a prediction not too long ago that you thought Adolin was going to die in a duel. Do you stand by that? And how we how we looking for that? 
so with what's happened, that definitely makes it look better, right? Because Sadius may encourage some duelers that are actually really good, you know? I'm sure there are some other shard bears and some other high princes here that are, like, actually good because for the most part, the, the one we had, I think there was one, yeah, the one in this chapter was at least better than the first. The first one, the guy just got, he got stomped in like 10 seconds. Quite quite literally. <laughs> yep. Quite um, literally, yes. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, it's very, very possible. I mean, I'm still going to stand by it. Okay. But, yeah, I am confident in Adolin's ability to win duels. But, yeah, I I, th- I think it is very likely to happen. I'll be I'll be very nervous if Adolin ends up dueling Sadius himself at some point. Just because if Sadius has realized what Adolin is doing, and if we if he gets in another scenario where like he's faking it not being as good as he really is, but Sadius knows that he's doing that, that could give Sadius a serious advantage in that duel, and I'll be pretty worried if if that ends up being the scene we we head into. I feel like Sadius would never actually duel Adolin. Probably not. I would love that, but Adolin would love that too. That's definitely Adolin's goal yeah. here. Yeah, the, the but yeah, I don't think Sadius would let himself get backed into a corner like that. All right. I just want to mes- mention one thing in chapter 26 before we move on to chapter 27. In battle, Renarin freezes. And we've seen this before. And jumping forward to chapter 27, we see that Shalon freezes. And they're not really the same. There's there's specific differences to them and Shalon Shalon wonders, I wonder how many hours have passed since I've been standing here. And Renarin says, oh, yeah, just my, my arms got shaky, and I would, but it only lasted for like five minutes. So it's, they're different, but on our outline, we have the word freezes applying to two of our main characters right next to each other. So I just wanted to, to bring it up and any thoughts there. I hadn't connected those at all until you just until you just said that. Even though you're right, we do have those two sentences right next to each other on the on that line. I guess I I was completely thinking about Shalon freezing as like shock. She she's still in shock from what she has seen. She's she's like mentally inhibited in in that manner. Whereas Renarin seems to be more of like either just straight up fear where he he's afraid of battle and can't bring himself to go into battle or it's just like a he can't bring himself to commit violence I, that was kind of where i felt like he was kind of at there of he just doesn't seem like a violent person and so he's he's eager to train he wants to learn but then when you actually you know put an enemy in front of him and you you tell him hey all right swing the sword and kill he can't quite bring himself to do that so they were different categories for me, but but now that you say that, maybe they're more similar than I think. What do you think, Paul? So I was gonna say I hadn't I also had not really thought of this comparison between Renarin and Shalon. But what I think it is showing more of is a future for Renarin rather than a comparison for Shalon, in that I like so. This is a flashback, Shalon, chapter two. Mm-hmm. So, like, they're probably really similar, um, right? In, in that, probably for different reasons, but the the whole freezing nature, things like that. And um, we've even seen Shalon really has no desire to like hurt people or do anything like that, like Renarin. Um, but we've seen how Shalon was for, for the most part. <laughs> for the most part, <laughs> um, I'll give it to you. Um, we've seen how Shalon has, I guess, developed from her young self that was like really traumatized and such. And obviously, there's still like issues and things, but for she's very confident, has come a long way. 
Um, and I think that's what we're going to see with Renarin. Right now, he's just not confident. He's, you know, he freezes up all the time. But I think we'll see that development to almost into, yeah, almost into someone more like Adolin, like in confidence and, and things like that. Um, but just kind of growing up, even though he's like 18 or 19 or however old he is. I don't remember for sure, but I still think of him as like a 13 year old. Yeah. It's, it's, it is hard to remember that Kaladin and Renarin are both the same age, and Shallan, I think, is a year younger than both of them. So, Let's talk about Jushu and Balat, because they get short, short cameos in this, in this chapter. Well, Balat doesn't show up, but we hear of his exploits, right? He uh, apparently has set something on fire. I don't remember what it was. He is up to no good. He almost burned yeah, down. Apparently, the, that's he almost burned down the servants' head or the servants' quarters. Is what we're told. And, and the implication is it's not the first time either. So yep. apparently, it's a hobby of his arson. This is this is pulled crabs apart a lot. So yeah, I was gonna say arson and. Animal abuse, it's not a great... <laughs> he does not have a good track record so far. Triple A. Imagine, imagine being tough. Jushu, and your worst crime is a little bit of gambling, a little bit of drinking, and then you're like, man, literally nobody in this family is normal except for Helleran, who's never around, so... Yeah, th- that's, this family is not in good shape. This... This family has some issues. If you remember back in the Way of Kings, Shallan was under Yasna's supervision in Carbranth, and she's like, eh, I'll just stay here. I don't want to go home. And now we understand why. <laughs> yeah. No telling what kind of, you know, like sibling pranks they'd all pull, you know, like leave a, like growing up wasn't super fun. Leave a burning Kremlin in your bed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened with Balot, but he is something else. He makes me very nervous. We haven't even really got... heard much from him. But she's got another brother too, right? Helleran, Balot, Jushu. Isn't there another one? There is. I don't remember his name though. It's like is it a younger brother? Like the only one younger than her? Jushu's the youngest. Maybe? So it goes her, okay. Jushu, br- second brother, Balat, Helleran. There is another brother in there. I don't remember his name, though. I hmm. wonder what his issues are. I'll put are. it on the screen right now. So the part that I actually was most interested in this chapter was what happens at the very end of of this chapter. So Jushu comes and uh, they have their little chat where they're all messed up and they've all got some issues, but then it ends with Shallan seeing the strong box in her father's room and the light emanating from it. And we learn that Jushu can't see that light. He doesn't even know what Shallan is talking about. And I, I think Shallan even describes the box as like, in a wall safe or something behind a tapestry or something. And yeah. so it's completely covered up and yet she can still see the light shining through. And that's, that's intriguing. And then we're left with these, these last two sentences in this chapter, which are kind of haunting. She says, there hid a monster, there hid mother's soul. And I just wrote in my notes, like what? <laughs> What is th- does she mean this like literally like her mother is trapped in this box or her mother's soul has been like ripped from her and her father somehow like has the soul or is this just more of like a metaphor of what's in the box destroyed mother's soul and so back kind of back to the whole maybe the weapon that killed her is in that box I'm confused I'm really confused And creeped out a little bit. Yeah, me too. I, you're very right that 
like it's obviously one of the two. The glowing makes me think that it's some way like a. We're assuming that Shalon, I guess, has pattern at this time. We kind of know he was around when all this stuff was going on, so We've it has to be that, you know yeah. some kind of connection there why she sees this glowing and no one else does um but the their hit a monster the hid mother's soul the glowing makes you think it's literally like somehow her soul is like trapped in this thing right but yeah yeah i, I feel like it'd be i don't know that all the kids seem to have like a vice of some sort i feel like maybe in this box is her I don't know, whatever addiction or crazy thing habit she had <laughs> was in there. Um, who knows? I think I'm way more curious in Shalon flashback chapters than I was Kaladin ones. I still loved the, like, Kaladin ones are great. Um, but I'm very curious because it's, like, a big mystery right now with these. And they're always, like, short. And they just drop some big ambiguous thing on your head and then <laughs> like all right bye yeah i mean the biggest um, so. the biggest intrigue if you will that we had in kaladin flashback chapters was did Liren steal the the spheres from rashon like that's that's the only mm -hmm. real intrigue we had the more yeah. kaladin chapters or flashback chapters were kind of just you know getting to know kaladin getting to know Stories, roshan that type yeah. of thing seeing kind of what shaped him right and then this is like a sci-fi horror movie like yep um, it's full-on murder mystery going on now yes actually i can just imagine if this were a tv show all of these shalon flashback chapters for season two would be like post credit scenes you know where the 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 there the episode's over title like credits start to roll and then you just hear the lullaby and Shalon walking through a hallway, and her father's like, "Now sleep, my baby dear." And then the the episode ends, and you're like, "Oh, that was terrible." <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I was gonna say, I was gonna make the comparison of like, it's like the trailer to what you want to see, like, like, "Ooh, what's in the box?" Like, right. you have to watch and find out. But we've already watched and found out nothing. So. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Any other comments on chapter twenty seven? None here. That's all I had. All right. Let's talk about boots. We've got two two Shalon chapters, two modern day Shalon chapters. And I mean we finally get our first Kaladin Shalon interaction. We've been waiting for a full book and 28 chapters for this moment. 1,500 pages or something like that. Yeah. And we finally get to it. And Shalon is talking Horn Eater and asks for Kaladin's boots. What are we, what do we want to talk about here? It was definitely not what I expected at all. I will give. So far, I've been very impressed by being surprised with things in these books this definitely did it because i we spent so much time thinking about oh who whoever shallan meets as she approaches is gonna set the pace for the whole thing it could be horrible it could be nice and then this happens and i was like okay <laughs> all right <laughs> good one you got me um yeah the the this was I would say this is funnier than the stick moment, the I am a stick. Okay. Um, at least listening to the audiobook was super fun because she is like, I am a fan. Yes. And lots of stuff. And it was very funny. I, I absolutely loved it, in all honesty. I I can't get over the height difference here for the boots. The boots aren't even going to fit Shalon here. Kaladin has been constantly described as towering over all the bridgemen, taller than Adolin. Like, Kaladin is a big guy. He's probably like, what, six foot four or something? Six foot three? Shallan? 5'11? 
five foot six. <laughs> like she, I think, she, I think <laughs> she does confirm herself to be five foot six when she's talking to Capsule, and it, it, like it's a joke or something. And these these boots aren't gonna fit her. Why is she asking for these boots? Yeah, it was. It had to have just been the first thing that popped into her head, and so she just ran with the ball. She can't, like I said, she dug herself way too deep and couldn't get out after the whole horn eater thing. So there she was. I I think Brandon Sanderson is having a little bit of a laugh with with all of us readers. I think he's fully aware that all the way through way of kings you're thinking oh when are kaladin and shalon gonna meet when are kaladin and shalon gonna meet oh they didn't even meet in the entirety of this book like oh way of words of radiance it's gonna happen it's gonna happen it's gonna happen and then it does happen and you just get this comical scene where yeah paul you and i have been trying to dissect this and figure out you know oh who's the first person she's gonna meet and what's that gonna mean for it all and you know i i even knew this was gonna be kaladin as soon as the chapter started right you know guards riding up on horseback oh it's Kaladin. he's going to bring her back to to dalinar this is going to start the you know the the intrigue or whatever here nope nothing important happens Kaladin or shallan just pretends to be a horn eater and steals his boots the end i bet i hope she gives them back like after, she has to because she can't be a horn eater this whole time right Especially if she meets, I, I definitely thought Rock was gonna show up and be like, "What? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> Excuse me." Um, this whole time, that's what I was thinking of. I feel like, but yeah, I feel like Rock is the type of guy to just go with it. You know, be like, "Oh yeah, you're a horn eater. Come here." Gives it like a hug or something. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> I I would fully expect in like a movie or show, a live action one, like. Being like, oh, you're a horn eater. Like, why don't we make some like good horn eater food? And they go and eat horns or something, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, Rock, Rock like, would flip the sucks. Rock would flip the script on her, right? I mean, he'd be the one that's you know smart enough to realize immediately, oh, you're not. So yeah, here's the traditional horn eater greeting hug, right? You know, crush your back and you know, whatever that is. <laughs> Shalon's like, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was actually surprised that Rock like wasn't. I was fully expecting as soon as they're like, the Horn Eater Princess, Horn Eater Princess Unu Lukuak Kinawa Tuatai, and I was expecting Kaladin to be like, oh, we have like a Horn Eater right here, and and Shalon to get in trouble right then. He would then. speak to her yeah. in native Horn Eater, and then it would be exposed and be all weird, but. Yeah, so whenever that comes out, I imagine she'll be like, oh, sorry about the boots thing, by the way, and <laughs> give them back. But in, in this scene, too, I'm, I'm learning that Tin is like the, the friend you had in high school that wasn't really actually your friend that just gets you into trouble just to laugh at you. Like, you know... Get, you, you're just tagging along because you, you think you're having fun, and then all of a sudden you realize the whole thing is blamed on you. And they're just laughing at you. Like, that's Tin. That's a really good way of putting it. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I definitely got that. Because, like, if Tin wasn't there, this would have been totally normal. Like, oh, yeah. She would totally. have probably said, I'm Shalon. If, like, okay, if Tin wasn't there, that's what I'm here for. Shalon probably would have gotten an escort back to the Shattered Plains, yeah. like from Kaladin. Yep. But nope, this is, nope, I'm the I'm a horny to princess, and Kaladin's and, like, whatever, and walks away. And, right. <laughs> and in, and instead, horses are, you know, riding up, and Tin's like, how's your horny? Oh, good, great. This is the horny to princess. It's like, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Backtracking a little bit here to the beginning of the the chapter, and and talking more about Tin, I'm trying to I'm trying to formulate you know what I what I think about Tin, and I, I really I really don't like her. She makes me feel un, un, uncomfortable really through a lot of these, partially because I feel like she's she's corrupting Shalon. We we have this. I, I talked about before how how Shalon is kind of a picture of of innocence for me, and how that's a bit ironic, kind of given a lot of what we know about Shalon. But I'm going to defend it here in a, in a second. But the tin is is like intentionally trying to make her more worldly, and that 
that makes me that makes me uncomfortable. I, I, it makes me want to say like you know get away from her. She's she's just fine how she how she is. And I I kind of classify Tin as like the opposite almost of of Yasna and how 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 Yasna's interaction with with Shalon went. Yasna was all about you know bettering yourself or or contributing you know scholarly works or finding honorable ways to to use your powers at least at least most of the time. Tin is the opposite. She's all about, hey, how can we use your powers for dishonest purposes? How can we, ooh, well, here's all the different kind of cons we can pull with with all of your skills that we have now is very different from the tutelage that Shalon has had in the last book. Tin is very much of what can I get out of the world instead of what can I contribute yeah. to the world. That's true. I... Also, have not liked ten. I think I said that in the previous episode. You didn't and like her from the first sentence. Like we we got like yeah, three sentences she, of ten. And I, you're like, I don't like this. I don't like this girl. <laughs> yeah, it, it was mostly like a just surface level. I was like, you're kind of ten's kind of annoying. I feel like you know, like why can't I just say I'm Shalon? Like why do I have to be a horny? I don't know. It just kind of annoyed me in all honesty. So maybe. Yeah, not the biggest ten fan, so So I have I have a theory about Tin. In Let's hear it. in this chapter in this chapter twenty eight, she references she makes a couple hints. I think she may have even talked a little bit about this before in the the other chapter we saw, but we know that she was with like a band of, of people. She's I think she's referred to them as like her men before, and they were they were doing some, they were doing a job. They were doing some sort of a job. And we, we learn here in this chapter, chapter 28, that her men were off pulling a job. I'm pretty sure she says down south, and she hasn't heard from them. And she's starting to get a little worried. And Shalon like notices, oh, she's a little worried that she hasn't heard from her men. I might be going out too far on this one, but what if Tin's men are the men that attacked Shalon's ship? And and took them down. Maybe Tin is working with the the ghost bloods. Maybe she is a ghost blood and was was involved in that. I don't know. I mean, she seems like a kind of connected on the inside kind of person, which which maybe ties in with like ghost bloods modus operandi, if you if you will. But beyond that, I don't have a ton of evidence for this yet. But just the fact that she says my men were down south, which is where Shalon was, and she hasn't heard from them. That could fit together with Shalon's half of the story, and that could get interesting if uh, if that's true. I was about to say the coincidence would be too crazy, but you made me think about there isn't that much south of them. Like they're in the middle of the Frostlands, headed up to the Shattered Plains, and there isn't actually that much to the south of them besides vacant Frostlands and the sea. So right. I don't know. Maybe they, yeah. That's true. I looked at my map briefly, but I thought like they could have somehow, because Carbronth is kind of at the bottom of the map. So that's what my first thought went. I don't, I don't think it's like correlated. Like, I don't think they would be the men at the ship, but I mean, I guess it's not too far away. So, that never even really crossed my mind. I kind of was thought it was just to show, like, I'm 10, I have the best men. I can't believe I haven't heard from them. Like, something absolutely crazy must have happened, you know? So, I didn't think about that too much. One thing that might reinforce your theory is that Brandon Sanderson does not like to waste words. So, if he's going to drop a hint at something... It's probably there for a reason. I've I've noticed that too. And the little like I've said a couple times in some of my previous theories, like, hey, this doesn't seem super important, but maybe it is. It always is. Yeah. It's always something. Right. What whether I've keyed into it correctly or not is the question. But those little hints, they're always something. Chapter 30? Chapter 30.
So in this one, this is the one where Shalon's like colorful foliage, like off the side of the road, right? And they they run over there. Yep. She like diverts the whole whole crew to go over and and see this little pond with the the colorful trees and brush and stuff like that. And she sits there and draws for a while. Yep. I believe it's called nature nature's blushing or something like that. So this was an interesting chapter for me. And the first thing I, I noticed, although I think maybe this is like halfway through the chapter or towards the end, actually, is she draws Gaz in another sort of like heroic posed drawing, maybe perhaps kind of like that poster behind you, Trevor, with like the, the epic, you know, wind blowing your hair sort of sort of thing. And this is the same kind of thing she did for Bluth, right? The other guy, slaver guy before. And and shortly after she did that, he he clung to that drawing and then ended up having a, a at least somewhat heroic death. He he tried to to make something of himself, partially because Shalon imagined him in that light. She she took a what was more of a you know a brigand and imagined him a hero and he kind of became one and so now i'm wondering if she takes gaz and draws him like a hero is this a little bit of foreshadowing is gaz going to get a chance to uh become a hero in the in the future i'm gonna i'm gonna keep an eye out for it that's not where i thought you were going with that i thought you were just gonna say gaz was gonna die you're like <laughs> well, well could be could be that too. shortly after shalon drew bluth bluth went and died so i think gaz is gonna die but that's not where you went with it I would believe that more. So I could I could see this happening, but I'm not sold because I don't know what else there is to happen. Because they're kind of there now. They're kind of at the Shattered Plains. And I imagine when they're hanging around there that Gaz um, just won't really be around. Or maybe for multiple reasons. Kind of conveniently disappear. Yeah. It might just... Get out, to, you know, get out. That's of kind town. of what Tavlokov did, right? We kind of ran into Tavlokov and we were kind of wondering, oh, is that going to become a uh, another plot point? But not really. He just kind of slunk off with his his folks and he's he's gone as far as we know. Mm-hmm. But on the continuing the the drawing train of thought, she draws Gaz, but then she also draws Yalb or maybe Yalb. She she draws, she's just kind of letting her mind wander and she draws and she draws, I forget the, the exact details of it, but she wonders if who she's drawn are the sailors from the ship that sank and perhaps they they survived. She's wondering if, oh, maybe they made it because one of them in the picture looks like Yalb and that has me really hopeful that perhaps that's that's true. Yeah, she does. It she, she's let her mind wander a couple times, and before now, when we've seen this, she just, just starts drawing uh, cryptics, or as cryptics appear yeah. in the in Shadesmar, and now she's drawing what appears to be Yalv and two other sailors climbing out of the ocean, and so whatever that means. Yeah, I don't know if I know enough yet to say like Shalon can predict the future with her drawing or or see the past or something crazier like that. But there's enough here to make me wonder. Again, back to the whole these little hints don't tend to be nothing. If she's if she's drawing Yalb coming out of the ocean, is that just her wishing that that's what happened? Is that just her dwelling on what what happened before, or is it maybe? her somehow subconsciously knowing that he did escape and and drawing that i'm i'm interested i kind of want to paint this picture of this chapter real quick because it's got some interesting mechanics of how the flora works in roshar so i don't know if you guys have really keyed into this it's been mentioned a couple times but there's rock buds in uh, on roshar and they kind of bloom and let out vines and the vines like drink water that are on the ground. And then when a high storm comes, they shrivel up 
and so they can survive the high storm and they like kind of close up into like a ball and then after the high storm they bloom again and all the vines reach out and drink the water again so whenever somebody walks close to them they they shrivel up and then if you like that they wait a little bit and then they bloom again so Shalon does the same thing here with this flower patch. She walks into the middle of it and sits down. And half of the flower patch is kind of like retreated into the into the blooms. And then they bloom again. And she has like f- a blooming flowers all around her. Because she hasn't because she hasn't moved. And th- this has been mentioned a couple times. Like the horses that Kaladin rides, they lick the rock buds so that the rock buds open up and then they they drink the water that's inside the the rock buds um because then yeah, i don't know that i just thought i just think it's really cool how the how the rock buds work it's not really important but i i enjoy it it is cool it may, i feel like rock bud is one of the most said words in these books <laughs> yeah because every time i like listen to stuff it they're always like and it just rolled off the rock bud or whatever <laughs> and like it just does this stuff all the time um and i think on the cover of this book is where you actually like see them or maybe it's on the first book both Uh, both. okay yeah and that's really the only good image i have in my mind for it which i mean it's like canonical i guess um but yeah they're pretty cool i think it's kind of a weird plant life system but that's fair that's honest you know I think that's part of what would make any kind of visual adaptation of this work really striking because you would, you would constantly have this reactive flora, like you're, you're talking about Trevor, where everywhere they go, the grass is going to retreat and come back and the the rock buds are going to react where they go. It'd be, it'd be a constant reminder that you're in a, in a foreign world, which I think would be really intriguing to a lot of, a lot of viewers, you know, watching a, a movie or a video game or something like that. One of one of my best mem- remembrances of the reactive flora here is when Rissens in Shinovar, and she sees normal grass and normal trees like like we have on Earth, and Rissens like they don't move, they don't they don't do anything, they're dead, and we would we would just be creeped out by moving plants. That's true. I would be. Be very afraid, I'll be honest. Depending on how fast it's moving, you know. If it just opens out and licks me or something, I'll get a little <laughs> might might trigger my flight or fight instincts, you know. Um No, you just learned that you need to lick it and then it'll open up and you can eat it. Uh, <laughs> uh I should have just known yeah, that. I mean if with. any any person that was obviously not a local. Yeah any Yakovetian. Yeah, exactly. So so something I want to maybe end on here in this chapter, chapter 30, is again some more interaction between Tin and, and Shalon. And before a couple episodes ago, maybe last episode, we we kind of, at least I kind of talked about how Shalon is, is in my mind, this kind of image of honesty and, and innocence. And I had to kind of retract honesty because she She's a, a walking and breathing lie. She lies to everyone she meets. So far, yes, it, yeah, exactly. So maybe, maybe not honesty in, in so much in that sense, but but I do really feel like she is innocent in in such a way that she's like she's naive. And, and this is a this chapter kind of explores that where where Tin is really kind of poking at Shalon and, and saying, you know, you don't understand hardship, you don't understand the world, which really makes me really actually intrigued by Shalon's character now because Shalon, as she points out, Shalon, Shalon even responds back to her and says, you barely know me. How do you know what I've been through? And, and Tin says, because you aren't broken. And I think it was earlier in this book when Shalon and Pattern were talking and Pattern's like, you're cracked. You're not broken, but you're cracked. And, and Shalon is this, She's such this interesting character because we know she's been through something terrible. We know she's been through this horrible family that she's had. She's had really rough times. She's had to do 
terrible things. And yet she still has this like childlike innocence about her that Tin is trying to like help her grow out of. So she's in a very interesting little ironic contradiction sort of Shalon is. I can't even explain it, but it's it's very interesting. Is she going to lean more towards inspiration or deception with her her powers? That is my biggest question right now. That is my biggest question of this entire book, actually, as we go, is where is Shalon going to end up leaning with how she uses her newfound newfound powers? And before we met Tin, we were we were excited about inspiration. We were excited about her using her powers for good. And now Tin seems to be pushing her very strongly in the other direction. She's all about deception. And so is Shalon going to be influenced by that and and really go down that path of using her illusion and patterns, voices, and whatnot to to deceive? I hope not, but it's not looking good right now. True. I, and I think it is going to... I say this every week. It's going to depend on who she's with and how things go in the Shattered Plains. Because I think what we've seen with Yasna... Sorry, with Shalon the most um, is... She's very, her actions are very highly influenced by what the other people around her are doing um, and how that affects her. And so I think it's mostly going to come down to that. Um, I think her innately, it's more of the inspirational side. That's what we saw initially with the bandits and, and deserters. Um, but if she's around a bunch of losers like 10 that pressure you into doing bad stuff, Tell us how you really feel. Yeah, weird stuff, <laughs> you know. Then, uh, then yeah, she'll be a, a loser. You know, they say it's important to, you know, choose who your friends are. You know, so I think it's. I actually do want to key in on this because you're right. Shalon does reflect a lot of who she's spending time around. Right after she got off a boat with Yasna, she's pretending to be important, light eyed lady. And then she spends a week with Tin, and suddenly she's lying to Kaladin for no reason. And if you think back, so she, Shalon is very much a, a sponge, if you will, of absorbing who's who's around her. And Kaladin, back in the Way of Kings, was not that. He chose to act differently because his father told him to. And it didn't matter that the rest of the bridgemen had given up. He had decided to be different and not let them rub off on him. So that there's a there's an interesting contrast in our two heroes here. True. And uh so also I was gonna say with um Shalon, like not only reflecting who she's with, but also, um, like m the the thing that made me think of that was when Yasna takes her to the alleyway and kills those men in, in that whole incident. That kind of pushes her over the edge to steal the soul caster at the time. Um, and so yeah, I think it's going to depend what other people do. It's going to kind of force her hand or make up her mind about things because if not, she's very. Uh, Undecided almost, kind of figuring things out as she goes. So. Any closing thoughts for episode 31? That is all other than you referring to Shalon as a sponge made me think of instantly Sponge Shalon Square Pants. I think that's her new name. <laughs> so. That's how I will be referring to her as we go See, forward. All right, sounds good. We can <laughs> politely ignore you whenever you say that, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> as I said at the beginning, I I feel like these chapters are building. They're they're building, building, building to to something coming up, and and I know the end of of part two is is coming. So excited for 
excited for what's coming up because I feel like it's going to be big. But we've been feeling that for a while now, so maybe not. We'll see. I was honestly going to say, I feel like our chapters have been building. But this kind of just like I've relieved most of the pressure in my mind. Like she's kind of arrived to the Shattered Plains, even though it's weird now. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm sure since we are getting close to the end of part two, it will be something bigger. But it's it's not like it like led up and then it kind of it's kind of plateauing. I feel like so. That's fair. All right. The only way we can we can know if that there's a climax at the end of part two is to read it next week. So we can read. Then we have interludes. We do have interludes coming up. Hopefully, is that then really this time? So. Yeah. All right, we can <laughs> wrap it up there, and we will reconvene next week. Thanks for joining me, Paul and Elliot. Of course. Until next time.